Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanggang Namasami Kaya gata no sati, pikawe bavita bavis sati, bahuli kata, yani kata, vatu kata, anutita parichita susamarada, ewani wo sikita bang. We will develop and cultivate mindfulness immersed in the body, make it our vehicle, make it our basis, establish it, exercise ourselves in it and bring it to perfection. Thus, you should train yourselves. Okay. So that quote there is a really beautiful one. And uh, it's found in a very short discourse. Um, today, we will be talking about the body. So if anybody would like to, this could be a good time if you wanted to stand up or change your posture at all, um, please pay attention to your body. Uh, we'll actually be talking about Buddhist body image. And just saying those words, um, it's one might be apt to just go into the head paradoxically or ironically, you just start thinking a lot, but just invite everybody um, to the extent that we can just to stay, stay in the body and stay um, embodied through the whole of, yeah, through the whole of the morning, if you can, through the whole of the, the day and the week and for the rest of your lives, if you can. Because um, it's just a, a nicer place to be. Uh, there's so many mental habits that we have, so many kind of gears that we just have churning all the time, um, that it can be good to be able to have this skill of tapping into something that's, that's different, that's more, more tangible. So that quote that I gave is from a really short but also quite potent um, discourse of the Buddha where he gives one of the most striking similes of the whole Pali canon, of the whole kind of Buddhist, uh, Buddhist scriptural um, canon. And this is where uh, the Buddha is teaching a group of monastics and he says, suppose that there were a beautiful a beauty queen, and the word he uses is Janapada Kalyani. Janapada Kalyani. Janapada means like country, and Kalyani means beauty. So we got the country beauty here. And Kalyana, this is the same word that we find uh, more often in Kalyana Mitta, or spiritual friendship, beautiful friendship, friendship with, with the wise. And that's, it means both physical beauty and also this more spiritual beauty. Uh, which is the context the Buddha uses it in more frequently. But here he uses it in the very mundane sense. The country beauty, suppose the country beauty comes and everyone hears, the people of the town hear, the country beauty is coming. They say, Janapada Kalyani, Janapada Kalyani. And they all throng and they, they get together and they, they hear that this beauty queen is coming to perform somewhere. And they hear that the beauty queen can sing and some hear that the beauty queen can dance, and they get even more excited. They say, the Janapada Kalyani can sing, and the Janapada Kalyani can dance. And so even more people come, and they're thronging, and the, the beauty queen is up on this, this stage. And so that's the, that's the scene. The Buddha has set this scene. And he says, suppose that then, so we've got this beauty queen, and you've got this mass of people thronging to, to see the beauty queen. And then suppose there was a, a person who comes, who loves life and does not want to die, who loves pleasure and who abhors, dislikes pain. And someone were to say this person, okay, person, I would like you to walk in between the beauty queen and the crowd of people. And following you, there will be an assassin with raised sword and we're going to put a big vat, a brass vat, filled to the brim with oil 
on your head. And what we'd like you to do is to walk in between the beauty queen and the throng of people. And you're going to have this vat of oil on your head. And as soon as you drop a drop of oil out of that uh, big old vat on your head, then the assassin is going to chop your head off. Um, what do you think? What do you think about this, practitioners? Would that person lose mindfulness? I'll, I'll ask you guys. Would that person lose mindfulness? <laughs> Hopefully not. That's a, that's a good answer. Hopefully not, because the consequences would be not so good. Um, and so too, uh, the Buddha says, this is a simile. Um, you all can train yourselves to keep mindfulness immersed in the body. You should develop and cultivate mindfulness immersed in the body like this. We will develop mindfulness immersed in the body. We will develop it, make it our vehicle, make it our basis, establish ourselves in it, train in it, and perfect ourselves in it. Thus, you should train yourselves. Boom. End of sutta. End of discourse. And uh, very, very potent and yeah, so rich, so rich. Um, part of um, our monastic training uh, for bhikkhus and bhikkhunis is we got, we got lots of rules. We got lots of rules. We got rules on top of rules. And um, 75 of them or so are about just kind of mundane ways of etiquette, ways that a monastic should just be in the world. And two of them are just about the way that we, we walk. So we're supposed to go about, whether walking or sitting, uh, well restrained. So like with this kind of good posture. And this sutta is evocative of, of that, you know, kind of having a, a sense of a bearing, a sense of, of dignity in the way that you move about in the world, kind of balancing this sense of immersion in the body. And I really love this sutta because it, it does a great job of comparing um, kind of a worldly sense of, of body image, what the beauty queen has for themselves and the relationship that all of the throng, the horde, everybody, what they think about the, the beauty queen as well. And there is this, uh, this body image. You can't really get around it. We, have, we do have a sense of what we look like, how we appear in the world. And unfortunately, there's just comparison that comes along with it. We're more attractive than so-and-so, or we're less attractive than so-and-so, or we're equally attractive as so-and-so. And uh, yeah, in Western discourse, you've got terms like a positive body image or a negative body image based on this superficial, just skin deep, whatever is just on the surface of things, almost defini definitionally, um, superficial. It's just all about what's on the, the externals of things, how we look and how we appear to others and what their sense and our own sense of, of beauty means. And the Buddha fortunately um, wasn't just locked into one particular body discourse, but talked about the, the body, encouraged this mindfulness immersed in the body. So uh, not just superficial, not just surface level, but really a felt inner three-dimensional uh, global sense of the body. Uh, and he talked about it in many ways. Last week, I had the really great pleasure to join Aya Anandabodhi, who is a, a bhikkhuni who lives now out on, in Port Townsend. And she and I taught a retreat in uh, Camp Samish. So it's near Bellingham. And we taught it all about embodiment. And it was just really great just to be up with her kind of presenting these things. She's been practicing mindfulness immersed in the body, uh, this felt sense of mind filling the body for decades and decades. And uh, you can feel it when you're around her. She's a very grounded, grounded person. And uh, yeah, the themes of the body, although it was embodiment, it was four days, the four and a half days. The first half day, we gave the precepts like we did just this morning and gave some reflections about the precept body, the precept body, which is probably a term unfamiliar to, to many. The next day, the full first day of the retreat was about heart body. So bringing 
uh, the Brahma Viharas, this loving sense of, of presence into our awareness with the body, so the heart body. The next day was on the whole body, how we can inhabit from the soles of the feet up, down from the crown of the head, everything, this whole, whole body. And if any of you were trying to follow along with that guided meditation, uh, you shouldn't feel at all uh, ashamed or weird or like you're an anomaly. If you found any blind spots or, or blank spots in the body, trying to fill the body with awareness, it's totally common to yeah, just come to your elbow or your thigh or just some part or even yeah, from, say, the chest down where you just it feels like a blank spot. You can't feel anything. And it, it's strange to, to feel that because you would think, oh, I mean, I can see it. I can see it with my eyes. It's there. I got something dangling beneath my neck but you know, I just can't feel it. Um, very common, and it's something that you can definitely train in, and um, yeah, we can learn to feel more of the body. So that was the second day of the treat, this whole body. Third day was on the elemental body. So the Buddha does talk about just being able to see the body in terms of physical elements. He mentions four, the sense of solidity, or the earth element, the sense of uh, movement or liquidity, the water element, the sense of uh, heat or lack of heat, the fire element, and the sense of um, yeah, another type of movement, the air element. So just this very first-person felt sense, not that the Buddha was trying to proclaim his own type of physics where every quark or molecule has a little bit of earth and fire and wind and whatever in it, in it but more just as just, just how the, the body feels from the inside. I can feel some earth, you know, you got, you got some muscles and you got some bones and you go, you start clacking the, the teeth and okay, that's, that's earth, that's just earth. And uh, it's a really useful way to get out of our own stories about the body. Um, if we can just shift into this uh, other view of the body and if, this seems too, uh, too foreign, this idea of just the four elements. We're all just all these other uh, periodic elements. Uh, you got the, uh, just the calcium of the teeth and all the nitrogen and oxygen and all the other, probably got some magnesium up in here and all the other stuff. It's just easier to feel hardness than it is magnesium um, from a first person point of view, at least for me. Um, so elemental body and then the last day was about a space body and not trying you know not talking so much about astral projection or any kind of out of body experience but feeling a sense of spaciousness within the body not trying to disembody ourselves and or you know any kind of uh, disintegration but yeah, feeling a sense of, of spaciousness and flexibility with our mental relationship with the body uh, the Buddha talked about four powers of an arahant, four powers of an arahant. An arahant is an enlightened person in a, in a Buddhist context. So an arahant um, is someone who is defined as having transcended uh, dukkha. So they, although they still can feel physical dukkha, if someone were, if you go up to an arahant and pinch them on the shoulder, they would feel it. There's a, a physical, it's not like they don't feel the human body, uh, but they don't suffer with it. Even if you were to pinch real hard, they, they wouldn't suffer. There would be no, um, yeah, no mental dukkha, no mental suffering to go along with any kind of physical suffering, which is just inherent in being a, a human. They have transcended greed, anger, and delusion, which is exciting, an exciting prospect. Um, if you can get your mind around believing that, it's is it possible? Is it possible for a human to transcend greed and anger? Um, maybe. Um, but one thing they've also been able to attain is a, a degree of mental flexibility, cognitive fluidity, just a way of not being stuck in one kind of body narrative that's totally positive. Every inch of my body is always beautiful, all the time. One could try to force themselves to believe that, but it just seems like a losing, a losing perception 
I mean, it's not going to take too long. It doesn't take too much looking, especially if you've got a mirror and you can look at like the backsides and stuff. I mean, it's not too hard. And no, no diss, everybody. I mean, uh, I certainly include myself in this. I mean, it's good to be able to admit that we got some ugly parts. We got some ugly parts up on us. And um, especially if you like go a little bit deeper, if you like you open things up and the fluids and the semi-fluids and yeah. And it, it's somewhat, somewhat of a relief to have these other discourses that, you know, there are, um, yeah, body positive movements and there's a lot of good in that. We don't, we definitely don't want to have a holy body negative image that we're stuck in that every inch of this is ugly all the time, always. Uh, but to try to force ourselves to shoehorn ourselves into this always sexy all the time image, it's, it's great that we don't have to do that and that we can, that the Buddha kind of said that we can have a more realistic view. Like um, not having to do that is, um, yeah, there's freedom in that um, because it's just true um, that we're not all sexy all the time. Um, so what this Arahant can do, they have four powers so they have the ability to see that which is unattractive as attractive. They have the ability to see that which is attractive as unattractive. They have the ability to see that which is both attractive and unattractive as attractive or unattractive. And they can see that which is neither attractive nor unattractive, just kind of, eh, as attractive or unattractive. So basically, to boil all that down, um, they're not stuck in one particular view of the body. Uh, they have a useful, um, yeah, a body image or a, a conception of the body. Uh, their minds can relate to their own bodies and the bodies of others, and not just bodies, but anything. They can see what's attractive and unattractive about, about things. Um, and that's great to be able to not be stuck in one particular perception about the world. Uh, and this really helps with our morals, with that, that precept body. So that third precept, I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. When you take that on and start trying to figure out what that means in the different roles that you, you serve, um, yeah, or the relationships that you have, uh, you start seeing a usefulness in this. So for celibate monastics, bhikkhus or bhikkhunis, we're celibate, we don't do sex of any kind, like ever, as long as we're in robes. And it's very useful to be able to shift, like, oh yeah, there is something attractive, but there's also something that's unattractive. And um, if we're married, if we're in a committed relationship, um, to be able to see someone else that's beautiful and not be a slave to, or only able to see the beauty in that other person that isn't our partner. Because if we're trying to keep some level of commitment and honesty with the person, then, oh, actually, yeah, that other person is attractive, but I'm in a committed relationship and, and yeah, is it possible for me to not focus in on the attractive bits, but to yeah, take in other aspects of the humans or the people that, that we're attractive to? Um, so, yeah, this level of uh, cognitive flexibility is just, it's just useful to be able to, be able to have. And an, an arahant has taken this uh, cognitive adaptability just to its utter uh, it's utter end. Just in a moment, they can say, "Oh, yeah, that's pretty," and it's also it's unpretty. It's attractive and it's and it's unattractive, and each of these has their their use. So, if sensual desire um, or yeah, sexual desire is coming up in a way which is inappropriate, we can focus on the unattractive bits. But if aversion, irritation, annoyance, anger, what anger does? is automatically focus in on and fixate on the unattractive bits. That person is just wholly unattractive. All the aspects of their character 
are just ugly. They're just a mentally ugly person. And an arahant can just, in the snap of less than the time it takes to snap, can just say, oh yeah, but also, you know, they, you know, they were probably a, a child once, and you know, they, there are probably reasons why they're, um, yeah, uh, morally repugnant and uh, unattractive for all these reasons. And yeah, there's some attractiveness, you know, they're whatever. You know, hopefully each of us can, as we get better at this, be quicker and quicker at being able to see, um, yeah, the noble things in the things which are, yeah, we can say good things about the people who are, um, yeah, we're not automatically attracted to. So those four powers, and we don't have to wait. It's not like we wait till we're an arhat, till we're fully enlightened to develop all those. We can start developing those, those now as we pay attention to uh, different aspects of, of a body image. The word the Buddha uses in that phrase that here's how you should train yourselves. We will develop and cultivate mindfulness immersed in the body, kaya gata sati. We will develop and cultivate mindfulness immersed in the body, make it our vehicle, make it our basis, establish it, exercise ourselves in it, and bring it to perfection. Thus should you train yourselves. When he says that this mindfulness immersed in the body, it's so much not just a superficial thing. It's not just a, a two-dimensional thing. Uh, poly compounds, you read them backwards. So for the most part, kaya, gata, sati. Sati is mindfulness. It's our capacity for paying attention. It's the capacity of, of awareness. It's the capacity of of knowing and the ability to, to move that in different directions. So sati, which is gata, which has gone to mindfulness, which has gone to kaya, the body. Mindfulness gone to the body. Mindfulness immersed in the body. And the cool thing about poly compounds is that you have a lot of wiggle room to figure out how you want to translate them and understand them and embody them. So the relationship between the different words is not set in stone. So it could be mindfulness immersed in the body, mindfulness immersed, gone to, along with the body, into the body, through the body, mindfulness immersed throughout the body. And yeah, I hope everybody uh, had some kind of success or unlatching or unhooking from the sense of the mind just being um, constricted and narrowly stuck behind the eyes and was able to do this kind of dropping into the body. Um, because you can, you can feel the body from the inside and that's really useful. That's what this mindfulness immersed, immersed filling the body is pointing to. It's not just an image of the body, it's a felt first person sense of the body, how we sense that and how we relate to other sentient beings that are similarly sensing from within their own bodies. So that first term that we, we talked about are taking this, taking the precepts, these five precepts or however many uh, ethical principles you have and the five pre pre precepts of undertaking the training to refrain from killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, from lying, uh, and from intoxicants. This is the basis of uh, Theravada Buddhist or a Buddhist morality. Uh, but really, whatever, whatever your ethical principles are, um, and most ethical systems really do have a lot of consilience and uh, overlap with those Buddhist principles. But this idea of the precept body is a concept which you find in Chinese Buddhism or, or nor Northern Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism. And the idea is that when you take precepts like this, there's almost this psychic aura or this um, you know, almost metaphysical body or like armor that you're endowed with, that you become endowed with is this armor or this force field that you're able to take upon yourselves, that it's a force field, an armor, there's a Thai word, uh, which is like a, a diamond armor, which as long as you keep your, your precepts, we're undertaking not to kill. As long as we don't kill, 
then this armor is kept intact. And then if we relate to our precepts in a way, say we, we, break, them, uh, we break them in some kind of way, we smack a, a mosquito in a way that we weren't, um, yeah, we wanted to not kill even insects, uh, if that's part of your precept, and you just out of habit because it hurts a little bit and you smack it, then uh, if that was part of your precept, then that armor gets a little bit of a chink in it, a little bit of a, a break in the armor. And yeah, it's, it's kind of a useful image, and I can't speak to that. I do have one teacher in Thailand, Lumpur Biak, who will say that, I mean, he is an unusual and somewhat fantastic human. Um, unusual, I haven't met many other humans or maybe any other human like him, but he will say that he can actually see different people's pre precepts bodies or these kind of diamond, this diamond armor. And yeah, he'll say that it's a real psychic phenomenon or some kind of aura that can provide a protection. But whether or not you believe in that or you can see it or you can uh, feel it, I think all of us can sense it. Like when we do feel like our, our precepts, our, our principles, our integrity are somewhat smudged. It's like we've got this white cloth of the precepts um, and there's a little bit of a, a stain or there's a little bit of a, uh, a mark on it and you can kind of feel it. It feels a little bit, feels a little bit dirty because we've started to get used to this level of cleanliness because we're not hurting anybody and we're intending not to hurt anybody. So you feel, you start getting this inner sense of strength from the, the precept body. So I wish I had more time to go into these other types of embodiment of mind immersed in the body of heart body, what it would mean to embody a sense of, of loving kindness and friendliness towards ourselves and towards other people. The whole body, what it means to really feel into and feel from the whole body, from the toes up to the crown of the head. What it means, this elemental body, being able to shift our conception from this is mine, I am this, this is myself, which is a really painful feeling or painful perception to have about the body because it's going to change. We're already getting older. You all have gotten 32 minutes older than when we started this talk, and it's just going to keep on going. Um, so being able to shift, oh, it's just earth element, earth element doing its thing, and water element, air element, fire element, and it's just a much less personal and a much less um, uh, it, it's a safer perception to be able to tap into than always just having to be me and mine and it's just spacious body a spaciousness of mind in its relationship to the body so in the talk there and we'll love to hear people's questions and thoughts around embodiment Handamayan dhamma kataya sadhu karang dhamana se sadhu 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 anumadani. Okay, so we can open things up to questions. If anybody has a question here, um, got Dave as a mic runner, you can just raise your hand and we can. Go to you and people on uh, Zoom. If you've got a question, you can raise your hand. Uh, that little cartoon hand works best because you bump to the front of the line. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you for this talk. Oh, OK. Oh, um, this feels uh, weird to confess, but the way that I grew up, I was taught, and it was like a value system of my entire life that like my entire value is my brain. And um, you know, a few years ago that would have been a humble brag, but I've come to realize that uh, that's really taking away from me, you know, the ability to feel in my body, but it's really deeply conditioned to not, like, I can't even tell when I'm getting sick, unless I'm, like, really sick and it's, like, way too <laughs> late. And so um, it was really deeply interesting to me to hear your talk because I've been trying to kind of go in that direction, but it also feels like a foreign country. 
And uh, so I'm wondering for someone like me, you know, where do you get started when there's like this like deep conditioning, you know, like body scan is like the place where they usually start us, but to me it doesn't resonate. Um, and like you, you spoke about many things, but where would you start to kind of like go through this kind of barrier in terms of practice? Mm, that's a great question. And I think a lot of a lot of people can sympathize with that, just feeling totally up in the head, because yeah, so many modern cultures just uh, give so much emphasis to intelligence and in the brain, and uh, just give so much weight to that. And I think when we close, we'll do a chant, which is all about um, spreading specifically loving kindness, uh, but it also works for one sense of embodiment, where we abide pervading different directions in front, behind, to the left, right, above, below, around, and everywhere uh, with this sense of loving kindness. But you can also, as you do that, experiment with using this local awareness, this sense of mind actually dropping out of the head. And it really is the case that it can feel like another country, but the borders are just almost, they become more and more porous and you can become more and more, you can know the body from more and more parts of it, and then you can know the whole body all in one, all in one go. And it's just a matter of, of training and just going slowly and yeah, filling up the, the body with your mind is to the extent that you can, and just pushing forward, pushing into those boundaries and allowing the mind to expand to the extent that you, that you can and that you, that you will. And yeah, there, I did mention there are all these different discourses on the body and um, ways that the Buddha talked about the body. And there's one somewhat famous you know, discourse where the Buddha talks about the 32 parts of the body, where you think about hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin, and then you know, some 27, 28 others. And uh, a lot of people can feel quite averse to that because it can be talked about in a way which is almost like yeah, pointing the super grossness of all of those and um, the nastiness of it. And people can think that Buddhism is just against the body. And um, Buddhism isn't against the body. It's just pointing out another way of, of looking at the body to balance things out. And the brain is, when it's working, and even when it's you know starting to not work, it is a pretty amazing organ. Um, but it's not totally reliable as we age. You know, the synapses aren't firing the way they used to. And um, it's good to be able to spread one's sense of well-being and sense of, like a wholesome sense of, um, wholesome sense of self, even outside of a narrow uh, brain, brain-centeredness, centered self. So I hope that helps. What was your name again? Malika. Malika. Oh, okay. Okay. Sadhu. Yes, Gary. Gary. Thank you. <clears throat> As you were speaking in response to that question, I suddenly had an image that comes out of something one of our, our friends here has been talking about for a few weeks, that notion of when things are a little difficult and I'm hearing a difficulty getting into the body in this case. When things are a little difficult, you're between a rock and a hard place, flow like water. And the image that I got suddenly as you were responding to her is of my brain just flowing like water all the way down to my toe. That's all. I just wanted to share that. Oh, beautiful, thank you, Gary. Yeah, one uh, exercise that Ayananda Bodhi guided us through was embodying, um, moving the mind into the body, starting with the right toe, and then moving up, moving up through the leg, and then as we go, not letting go of 
our awareness of the toes of the feet, but continuing is like filling up the body with awareness. So as we're aware of the toes, we're aware of the feet, the calves, the thigh, coming up like this, going into the hand. So skipping the torso and the head, going into the hand, up the right arm, coming around, down, continuing to fill up the left upper arm, the left lower arm, the hand, down into the left upper leg, left lower leg and left foot and left toe. And then you just got this kind of horseshoe of uh, awareness and it's a rather fascinating exercise to embody oneself. Thank you, Gary. Judith, please. Could you speak a little bit, please, about the body as process? Mm. So like as verb rather than as noun? Yeah, it's this idea of that Buddhism is basically all about verbs. Um, yeah, there's no, no nouns in Buddhism. Um, that's the implications of this idea of not self, not only, and it's an interesting thing just to look at, where are all the nouns? Where is the self inside of here? Where is the self inside the body? Where is the body inside of the body? Uh, where is the me inside of my sense of the body? Um, and you look, and it's a great question to ask, and yeah, you don't have to force an answer on it, but I mean, it's hard to find um, if it's there at all. And the Buddha would, can, you know, would say, actually, keep looking, and maybe there isn't a center to it all. Um, but yeah, the process of the body, I mean, you look at photos of yourself as a baby and um, of the people you know as they were young, growing older, the body, the body is definitely a process. And um, yeah, sometimes it's strange that there's this, um, yeah, the body seems more me sometimes than, than the mind, even though um, the body is just constantly changing all the, the movement of the body. I mean, one way you can approach it from like a a philosophical level or just an intellectual level, just thinking about all the ways that every cell of the body is just constantly changing. Every cell would have replaced itself purportedly in, in seven years. So however old we are, divide that by seven, it's a totally different body that many times around. Um, that's humbling, but also just, you know, one exercise we talked about in that retreat was this kind of tying back into this sense of flowing is that you, know, you can feel the blood in the body, feel the coursingness, feel the process of at least one aspect of the body, the blood, the circulatory system. And uh, you can do that by yourself. You're just putting your hand on your, your wrist to feel the pulse there or on your carotid artery up here. And there it is. And you know, just lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. I think that's how doctors say, uh, make the heart beating sound, lub dub. Um, but yeah, it's just right there. And it can also, it's also quite, can be good if you're able to do it in a smooth enough way when you're talking with other people. Cause it's not like we're just thinking that there's a solid me here, but we're imputing a solid you and everybody else over there. So to get out of that reification of self and other, you just talking to somebody and your hands can be behind your back and you're just feeling your pulse like, oh yeah, just, just blood, just blood, you know, moving all around the body. And probably the same in their body, and it just uh, yeah, decenters whatever story we're, we're telling in a way. So being able to find ways to feel into the process of the body, the same is true when you yeah, feel the heartbeat, or even sometimes you can hear your heart beating if you yeah, kind of close your, uh, your ear in a certain way. And yeah, that's just one way, but these are so interesting because it's almost... Uh, it's almost an infinite number of ways that we can look at the different processes of each of the organ systems and organs of the body. So you have to find, find your own and um, that are the most meaningful and most impactful. So I hope that is something. Yeah, thanks, Judith. One thing I'm curious about is like when I think about not self and the emptiness of the self, like one of the easiest conceptions for that of me is like the emptiness of gender. And I think so much about like um, most people have this obsession with like 
am I masculine presenting enough or feminine presenting enough or androgynous enough, you know, based on how they feel. And when I look at monastics, somehow there's like this, and maybe this is just my perception of like disattachment from gender and a lot of the way of that comes from like not having hair, having the same robes and whatnot. And so I'm really curious if there are any suttas or ways to think about like detaching from that sort of self-consciousness of like, am I performing gender in a certain way or like what are my expectations of my body and what it looks like and does based on the way other people gender me? Yeah, no, thank you. Very good, very good point. And whatever kind of foothold we can get into this perception of not self, you point to a really fascinating one of just, yeah, where is my, yeah, my sense of gender or sense of masculinity, femininity, any, any, anywhere on that spectrum? And uh, it does become a very moving, moving target. There is a, a sutta where the Buddha is, um, this Brahmin comes up to him and the Buddha was said to have a, yeah, he's a really attractive person and have a real sense of regalness to him. And so this Brahmin is really impressed and comes up to him and he says, what are you? Are you a, are you a god? And the Buddha says, no, I'm not a god. And the Brahmin says, are you a Gandhava? which is like a celestial musician, kind of cool word, celestial musician. And the Buddha says, no, not a Gandhava. Are you a Naga? This is like a celestial dragon. The Buddha says, no, not a dragon. And the questioning keeps going on, and the person says, are you man? And the Buddha says, no. And then this questioner says, are you a woman? And the Buddha says, no. And then the person says, well, if you're not a god, and you're not a Gandhava, and you're not a Naga, and you're not a man, and you're not a woman, well, what are you? And the Buddha just says, uh, I'm awakened. There is this awakenness. There is just the Buddha, that which is that which is knowing. And that's fascinating to look at the non-genderedness, the utter non-genderedness of knowing, the utter non-agedness of, of knowing. There's no race to the knowing. There's no, the sense of knowing is, it's just awareness. And um, that's to be able to shift into a, a type of, um, yeah, a simplicity like that can be really useful um, in a world which is constantly putting labels, putting labels on us and our own habit to constantly put labels on other people. It's unkind and unuseful for ourselves because we become, yeah, bidden, beholden to our own self-perceptions and it's an unkindness to others. I don't know this person and I certainly don't know this person deeply and um, <laughs> on some level, you know, it's uh, whatever kind of perception I could have that pers of this other person. This is a great quote from the Buddha. Whatever way you conceive of it, the truth is ever other than that. So, um, yeah, cognitive humility. Um, so really useful. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Hello. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, just a really quick note, also in response to the question that was asked. Um, there are two texts that I highly recommend. One's called um, Buddhism Beyond Gender by Rita M. Gross. Uh, she's a very well-known Buddhist scholar who passed away somewhat recently, and the publication was published posthumously uh, after she died. And um, she really dove into the topic of gender and Buddhism and how to dismantle that as identity um, and how it shows up in Buddhist literature as well. And second to that is... Uh, the Hidden Lamp series, uh, 20 Centuries of Awakened Buddhism and Awakened Women in Buddhism. And the, the, the book, Hidden Lamp, is a compilation of women's uh, teachings and stories, both um, Buddhist, monk, Buddhist nuns and lay women across the different 
lineages of Buddhism. So there are Theravada teachings, Mahayana, Zen, Tibetan, and so on. And um, actually this text is really interesting because it specifically does speak to the issue of gender and illusion of gender. And it, it is actually one of my favorite Buddhist texts. Awesome, thank you very much. Hidden Lamp, the Hidden Lamp, and then Rita Gross. I think she's written a lot, um, so. Yeah, thank you very much.